Hello, this is part eight of our game making tutorial. We um, are going to get on to like, doing timers and stuff today, but we have a few bits of housekeeping to do first. Um, one thing I noticed last time was that our exploding enemy doesn't actually harm the player in any way. <laughs> so, a possible disadvantage of an enemy. Um, the way we should do it, I think, is actually... Um, let's rename this. Oh, in fact, I, maybe I can teach you something um, useful here. Um, so the issue is that the code we have uh, on the player checks for um, did we uh, get touched by an enemy, by an O enemy, it says here. Um, and that sort of semantically sounds right, but O enemy is actually only one kind of enemy, and the exploding enemy is a totally different thing. They have, share some behaviours, but they're not children of the same parent yet. And I think they should be, but I think the parent should be called O enemy, really. Um, so we need to rename this one. Um, so I will, I will rename it. Um, I guess we could call it O Shrinking Enemy. But now we want to find uh, everywhere we've referenced that O Enemy because we've renamed it now. Um, Game Maker won't update every reference to that thing because you might not want it to. Um, so we need to find all the references to O Enemy. There may be only one. There might be a, maybe one other. Um, so you can do that by go to scripts and search in scripts. And although it says scripts, it actually means all behaviors, all code that you've written. Um, which is one great advantage of doing everything in code is it means everything you've ever, every behavior you've ever defined will be covered by this search. So we just type in our enemy there. And there are, ooh, interesting. Oh yeah, okay. So it's found two mentions. We'll double click the one with player. Um, that one's actually correct, we want to keep that, don't we? Because that will now refer to our enemy class when we create it. We haven't created it yet, uh, but we will. Um, and if I get that out of the way, there is one other mention. It's in the, it's on the enemy itself. So the enemy's been renamed, but it thinks there's a mention of the, the, oh, enemy here? Is there, though? <laughs> I don't see it. Oh yeah, there. Oh, 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 that's good, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm an idiot. Uh, that's the line that creates an enemy when we destroy an enemy. Um, and we actually don't want that, because soon, when I do the timer thing, we are going to um, have enemies spawning automatically rather than being created by you destroying them. Um, I think it was throwing me as it highlighted the instance destroy line. I'm like, is it highlighting that because it used to be referring to the O enemy object? I don't know. <laughs> Um, this is a good lesson in how you can completely miss incredibly obvious things that are staring you in the face. And why gunpoint took three years. <laughs> um, so, we can actually, if we refresh that, yeah, okay, the, the one that we've corrected disappears. We're leaving that one as it is because, as I say, we're going to create a new, um, I call them kind of categories or classes. Um, and we'll just create a thing called O Enemy. It'll do nothing, it'll have no appearance, we'll never create one ever. Um, but it will be the parent of Shrinking Enemy. Parent. Oh, enemy. Okay. Exploding enemy. Parent. Oh, enemy. And now that player check will just load it up just to show that it has hopefully gone orange. Um, although, I guess red. Um, yeah, it will now detect any enemy. So anything that's a, a child of the enemy object. Um, I've also uh, I've imported some new sounds, uh, also made in that VFX thing I showed before. Um, and so let's add those. Uh, the player has his own like death sound now, and that's already in there. But um, the hmm. I thought there'd be a line here about making a noise. Maybe not. Um, let's do it here. Audio play sound a explode. Yes. I think maybe I had, oh sorry, I've got to specify priority in loops. Priority one, loop space. And I'll copy and paste that, because I think I want the same thing for now on the exploding enemy. Ultimately you might want to have those play different death sound effects, so I won't make it into a function or anything. Um, but yeah, explode into a number of chunks. <laughs> That's definitely a thing that needs the sound. Um, and then player death and things done, and then I've got a sound effect with chunks reassembling. You know, I said when I made this, it would be great to have a, like a noise as they click into place. Um, we don't really have a clicking noise, but we have something. <laughs> so um, 
we can see from our excellent commenting that this is where the uh, this is the bit of code that triggers when we are finally reassembling. Um, and so if we take that, oh wait, sorry, I could just copy and paste that. And now instead of a explode, we'll say a uh, what was it? Chunk arrive, wasn't it? Chunk arrive, indeed. Um, so that's when that's when any chunk arrives. But then further down here, where we reassemble the player, there it says instance create player. Um, we'll play a special sound effect of reassembling. Re is that going to work? Yes. Okay, let's say okay to all that. Test it out. I also changed the um, the player's shooting noise to be a bit less intrusive, <laughs> just because they're firing so many bullets. Let's go check it's recording. Yes. There we go. I can't hear that at all. I can't hear anything at all. I wonder if I have changed the volume of my speakers. Nope. Okay, now I got sound. Uh, let me just check that it's not too loud or anything, because who the fuck knows since it just vanished for a while. Um, no, that should be quite enough. <laughs> okay, I can barely hear it, but I think I need it that low. So, um, enemies make a nice little squish noise. Um, let's check that they kill us. They do kill us. And then we should hear something. I can't hear that, I'm going to have to turn it up. I have to have it very low because otherwise you can't hear my voice over it. Um, and amplifying my voice makes it go horrible quality. Uh, what? Oh, I put it in the wrong place, didn't I? <laughs> we just need to tweak that. Okay, but that basically sounds good. Um, it's just that it shouldn't be when it changes direction, it should be when it actually arrives. Both the sounds should be in the arrival thing. It's just that if we've got all of the things in position, then that's when we should um, reassemble. Okay, let's start. Um, next, let's do the spawning thing. So the object that should spawn enemies, I think, is the game object, uh, since that's all that's persistent, it's always running, it's always there. Um, and we want to set up a timer for that. So I'll make a new section for enemy spawning. Um, and the way I do timers is not the way that Game Maker sort of suggests, or it's not the built-in way that Game Maker has. Um, Game Maker has a thing, thing called alarms, and I use those for gunpoint, pretty much. I think, yeah, they'll, for all of gunpoint. Um, and I'm not going to use them ever again, <laughs> because they are, they're like variables, but they, um, they tick down automatically, which is nice. But they're always called Alarm 1 or Alarm 2 or Alarm 3, so I just kept forgetting what they were and what they did. Um, and so I'd rather just control it myself and have nice, um, explicit, descriptive uh, variable names. It does mean you need two variables for any given timer thing you want, um, and those will be for enemy spawning, we want to tell it how often we want enemies to spawn. So how many seconds between enemy spawns? I'm going to call it seconds between enemy spawns. Uh, let's say one. Um, so that's pretty rapid. Um, it's good to have things rapid at first so that you can see them working because if it's too rare then you just don't see it happen at all. Um, and if there's a bug that only happens one in every ten times you want to see it happen. You don't want that to be something you don't discover for another six hours. Um, and then we want a timer that will actually tick up. So we'll say seconds since last enemy spawn. And I'll say that's zero at first because there's some enemies on screen, so we don't want to spawn the new one immediately. Um, and I'll copy and paste. Let's leave that open actually. And um, then I've got the step event because for this to tick down, obviously, something needs to be running the step event to make that happen. And we will make a new section here too. Enemy spawning. We will say. First, we want to decrease, oh, sorry, increase the seconds since last enemy spawn. So, seconds since last enemy spawn equals that plus um, not just one, but one divided by room speed. So, that's what the reason I have seconds in the name there. So you never forget what it's measuring. It's not steps. It's not frames. It's not um, anything that could vary. It's uh, 
seconds and the way we say seconds is uh, if you want to say one per second it's one divided by road speed and we do want to say one per second because we want it to go up by one second per second <laughs> pretty logical um, and then we want to say uh, when do we want to spawn an enemy? We want to spawn it when that figure reaches the other figure. So if that figure is greater than or equal to seconds between enemy spawns, then we'll put some stuff in here that, that spawns an enemy. Um, but also, before we forget, we should make sure that the second since last enemy spawn is set to zero, because we've just spawned one, so it has been zero seconds. Um, and that is it for the timer. So now we just need to say instance create. Um, we'll, for now, we'll do this the same way we did the previous enemy spawning, which was random. The x value will be random room width, which means a random number between 0 and the room width. Y value will be random room height. And the type will be uh, Now, we've got two enemy types now, and we want some of them, we want each of them to have a chance of spawning. Um, and there's a neat little function you can use um, called choose, where after you say choose anything in brackets, it'll pick between them randomly, and each one has an even chance. Um, so if we say, oh, shrinking enemy, oh, exploding enemy, now there's a 50 50 chance of it being either one of those. And each time this runs, it'll pick again. Um, we might want more exploding enemies than shrinking ones, so if we copy and paste that, um, so we've mentioned exploding an enemy twice now. Each thing you mention has, an, has the same chance of happening, so that'll make it twice as likely to get an exploding enemy. It's a bit hacky, but it's quite it's a nice, simple, visual, um, visually clear way of doing it. Um, the other way of doing it is to actually generate a random number and then test whether it's above a certain threshold and then spawn something if it is, um, which is how I was doing it for ages, and I only found out about, out about choose like a couple of months ago. Um, and it's great. It's all done. So. Let's just test that, that should work. Let's kill everyone first. And now, oh yeah, our room is enormous, isn't it? So it's going to be hard to find whoever, whatever we spawned. But there's one per second, so we should, ah yeah, here we go. We should find there's quite a few hanging around in various places. This is another advantage of having a high spawn rate. If I put it too low, we <laughs> wouldn't be able to see anything. Um, so I'm going to shrink my room because it's actually... it's. I made it big to show you that you can have a view moving around the room, but um, I don't want it that big. I'm going to have a slightly bigger than my display, so I, the camera will still pan, um, but we should be able to see things spawning and not have to go hunting for them. Okay, things are spawning. It's actually not a bad rate at all, is it? Particularly because we can fire like 60 bullets a second. <laughs> um, oh yeah, the other thing we need to fix uh, as a matter of housekeeping is um, that our bullets go through enemies. Um, so, Right now, it's not a problem with exploding enemies, but with shrinking enemies, when bullets going through it, it's shrinking them all the time. And I said last time, like we don't care too much about that yet, but we might as well fix it. And it was in the hit by projectile thing, yeah. So this tests against all projectiles. Projectile could be a bullet, could be a chunk of a player, and it could be a chunk of the of an enemy. And the reason we stopped destroying the projectile was that if you destroy a chunk of a player, then the player can't respawn because there aren't enough chunks to reassemble. And that's a bit serious. <laughs> so. Um, I think we'll just say uh, if there is one, then um, we can test what type it is by saying if incoming projectile dot object index object index is um, what kind of object is this thing? So when you're firing out bullets, there's hundreds of bullets on screen. Each one is an instance of the bullet object. So each one, if you ask that thing what its name is, it would be like 110679. But if you ask it what its object index is, then it will be um, O bullet. But actually, yeah. <laughs> if you printed it out, it would be a number again, but um, that doesn't matter. So 
we want to test is it um, a player chunk that's one we don't want to destroy. And in fact, we we want it to we want this trigger if it's not a player chunk. And the way you say not in any kind of um, you could do the whole if statement and then have an else bit and then put bit what you want to do in the else bit, but um, to make an equals into a not equals, you put an exclamation mark in front of it. It's not, I, I kind of avoid that when I can because it's just a very small character that completely inverts the meaning of what you're saying. <laughs> so you have to be pretty sure um, of what you're doing. Um, in fact, maybe it will pay to make a comment about this. If the projectile is not a player chunk, then with incoming projectile instance destroy, um, that should be fine. Should we test it quickly? Yeah, let's test it. It won't make a huge difference because firing a lot of bullets while those things will still get rid of it pretty much. Um, but it'll be slightly less easy. And that'll matter more when we have slower firing weapons. The bullets do get absorbed. And can't really tell with the chunks, but my chunks <laughs> do indeed get absorbed. Oh, I love the way that they kill enemies, actually. It's really cool to see them like, killing enemies on the way out and then also on the way in. <laughs> it's starting to feel like a kind of a game. Um. So, I'm kind of playing now. <laughs> um, let's do one more thing, um, and this is I want to give the player new weapons, but I probably won't get to actually making a bunch of interesting weapons in this episode. But the question arises: if the player could fire in two different ways, how would we handle that? How would we um, make the code work? And I would like a system where we can add weapons quite easily and test different ones without necessarily replacing the one we've got. Like, I can tinker with the bullet right now and change its rate of fire. I've just shown you how to do timer, so we could do a timer for that. Um, but I'd be replacing this current gun, and I quite like the current gun. Um, so it'd be good to add it as an alternative. So we could have a sort of big nested if statement of, like, if weapon equals machine gun, then do this, and if weapon equals shotgun, then do that. The problem with that is, like, every time you add a, um, add a weapon, you've got to describe its behavior in here and they'll each be their own variable name and basically what I'd quite like to do is um, make them their own objects this isn't necessarily the only way to do this um, and it might be overkill in this case but it's a good technique to know about how do you make two objects that um, make some objects that are kind of owned by another object and stick with it all the time um, so this code that says firing I'm going to take it all out and I cut it, so that's my clipboard now. Um, tick that, and now let's go to insert object, create an object called O weapon. Um, maybe we'll put O machine gun, because that's kind of what this thing is. A bit, it's a bit extreme, but um, let's give it a step event. Let's add a chunk of code, and in that chunk of code, we'll paste all that stuff. So now. When the left mouse mountain clicks, it's the gun, it's the machine gun that responds to it. Um, of course, this won't exist initially, so we don't really want to place one of these in the level. If this is a thing that belongs to the player, and the player is always going to have it, and the player needs to know its name, um, so the player should actually create it. When the player is created, let's create this. Um, so, our player doesn't even have a create event, which is kind of amazing. <laughs> but we'll add one, and we'll the code in it, and we'll say, um, I'm going to say current weapon equals, um, not that, sorry, instance create xy of a machine gun. So it will create a machine gun and it will remember who it is, um, it will remember its name so we can refer to it all throughout the game. Um, and we should also let the machine gun refer to us. So we'll say current weapon dot owner equals self.id. So this this line says um, create it and remember its name and this line says tell it what our name is. So the current weapon will have a variable called owner that always refers to the thing that owns it. And that will be useful for a bunch of reasons. 
Uh, but pairing object versus, I use it all the time. Um, and it's really handy. Um, so let's see what else we'd need to work with this. I think for now we can just do that um, and see how it works. The one thing we need to do with the firing code is all of this is kind of player relative, and right now, um, so when we click the mouse button, it um, creates a bullet at X and Y. Well, X and Y is going to be. Um, we better have our X and Y actually follow the player, right? Why is it going capitals? Okay. Uh, X equals owner dot X, so that means follow our owner. Y equals owner dot Y, and then when we give the bullet direction, we use our image angle. Oh, who are we? We're just some random <laughs> fake object. Our image angle won't be changing at the moment. So let's copy our image angle from the owner as well. And that should be it for now. Oh, the kick um, should apply to our owner as well. So kick doesn't lock in the gun back. I mean, we could do some kind of effect with that, but right now the gun's an invisible um, object that just kind of handles some code for us. So we're actually going to say owner x is not backed by that. We don't need to change any of this stuff. That's all just pre calculation for this. This is the bit that actually does something. So that's where we need to put that code. So now that should be enough to make us make it fire. We'll see. So hopefully the system will be able to pick up new guns and add them to our inventory, and we'll have basically an inventory system at the end of it. Yeah, I can shoot. <laughs> this is one of those things where testing it and seeing if it works reveals the exact same game you just had. <laughs> um, oh wait, no, I'll just show you something else. Because um, there is a problem with this, and I'll fix it, but I'll show you the problem first. Um, and it's because the gun is getting all of the information about where the player is and if it's in the jungle and stuff, but what if the player dies? <laughs> Your game crashes! Um, so that, by the way, it's looking for the player, and the player's... the object index of the player is... 100,000. <laughs> That's, those are just a bunch of numbers that it pulls out of nowhere at, at runtime. Um, but if you say O oh, player in those, I mean. So, on our gun, on our machine gun, we want to check that the owner exists. So we'll say, if instance exists owner, then do all this stuff. Don't do it. And then at the end we could say else instance destroy. Don't have an owner, we just want to kill ourselves. Um, when the player reforms, the player has been created. So the player will create a new gun when he does that. Um, so we don't need to stick around, we can kill ourselves as, uh, as easily as that. Um, if you don't like... Uh, this is probably the nice way to do it. The other way you could do it is... Um, if you didn't want to indent all your code and make more nested if statements, you could say if instance exists owner equals false, i.e. it's not true, then instance destroy type and type. Um, but then it would carry on running all that code. Um, so you'd also have to say exit. So when you say exit, it will skip everything else in this chunk of code. Um, it's not great practice to have a lot of exits all around because then when you're debugging it and you're saying like, oh, why isn't the why isn't the owner being kicked? Why isn't it, why isn't that happening? And you're looking at this code and it's definitely there and we're definitely passing the this check. Um, and then you realise, oh shit, there's an exit statement like six like 16 lines up and that's triggering in a way I didn't expect. So that's why it's not great to have a lot of exit statements like that. I prefer this big nested loop because then you, when if this code doesn't appear to be running, you think, okay, why isn't that running? Well, it's is mouse button being pressed? We can test for that. And then is does owner exist? Ah, owner doesn't exist. So that is why it's slightly better to do it this way. It is it can be slightly unwieldy, <laughs> but it's better. So that's good. Um, now that's just one of them. Um, I guess what we should try doing is let me actually place it in the level. Let's draw a sprite for it. <laughs> I'm just going to do this quite quickly. Edit sprite. Create a new one. It can be as small as I like. I'm just literally just going to draw the world's worst. Gun. <laughs> I don't even care. I don't even care. I know. I know it's terrible. <laughs> and that's it. 
because now what I want to test is like the ability to pick up a weapon. So you won't really see this. I mean, we want, might make some kind of power-up sprite or whatever for different weapons. It's dumb because your player isn't really... It's not an actual machine gun. It's, they're going to be viruses, like emitting some weird microbes or whatever. Um, but for now, it's just important that we can recognise what it is. So now we will try not starting with it, but placing one in the room. If it will ever load the room. Objects. Place a machine gun. And we'll place one over here. And now, if we go into the player's code, player's create event, and instead of creating that, um, we'll never create it, but when we pick it up, we will want to do that, so I'm going to just cut that for now. So now nothing happens when I create event again, which is fine, um, but we do want to say uh, this thing where we um, detect enemies, let's look for maybe higher up we should look for um, pick up weapons and we'll do this just the same way we have previously um, uh, weapon touching that's a weird thing to say because instance place x y o machine gun for now later on we might make a parent object to that where it's just a weapon or something um, then if instance exists for weapon touching, then based on that line, current weapon equals weapon touching. We want to store it in a variable that won't get changed unless we pick up a new one. Because um, if we just said if we just said weapon touching, uh, sorry, if we just said current weapon here, then that would be great for the frame when we pick it up. The next frame, when we're not touching one, it would overwrite it with nothing. So we need that temporary variable weapon touching, and then we don't use that. That's a, a thing where we use this frame. Um, so if there is one, then store it as our current weapon, um, and set its owner to us. And now we need, we do this a bit differently now, don't we? Because um, our weapon, where we place it on the ground, is going to destroy itself, because it doesn't have an owner. So let's change that code so that um, if there isn't an owner, then it just does nothing. So it'll just stay where it is. That means when we die, it'll also lie on the ground. That's not necessarily a problem. Um, this is interesting. I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> Messing with a lot of fundamental stuff here. No, it crash. It needs an owner. Okay, yes. Okay, so not only does the owner not exist, it was never even set. So let's add a create event to the machine gun and just tell it to owner equals uh, no one is a special word that just means this thing could be an object or an instance of an object, but right now it's nothing. So that will fail an existence check when we say, does the owner exist? If it's set to no one, it doesn't exist. It's the person that doesn't exist. Okay, and now if I, I'm thinking, oh my god, <laughs> what happened there? Okay, an enemy spawned on me, right? Yes, okay. Um, so, I'm clicking and nothing's happening, and an enemy spawned on me again. We're going to fix that, I know how to fix that. Um, and if I walk into the gun, oh my god, it's obscured one of my eyes. Because <laughs> now it's got a sprite, it's actually displaying on top of me. But now I can fire, and when I die, it lies on the ground again. It's good, because I don't start with one, so I need it back. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can shoot with the gun and I can't shoot without the gun. Um, so that's kind of the groundwork for something. I, um, next time we'll go into like uh, placing, uh, having multiple weapons and how to handle that because I want to show you, I want to talk about arrays, but that's kind of a big new thing so I won't introduce it now. What I will do is just, let's just fix that spawning thing because um, I meant to do that when I introduced it on our game object, on our game object, which I definitely clicked. Um, when we spawn an enemy, instead of just purely random width and random height, we don't really want them spawning on top of us. Uh, we could do like a warning sprite to show that, that they're coming in, but really the bigger problem is that I just would rather they weren't teleporting. So let's instead, let's create some like 
a uh, we want to create like a spawn x value and a spawn y value uh, without the space. Um, and what we want is for them to be um, at least one of those dimensions has to be outside the room's limits. Sorry, at the very edge of the room's room limits. We want to put them like right at the edge of the room. And so, so that they're coming in so they don't spawn where you are. Um, and we don't really want them to... We want to make sure that they're not both inside the room, for sure. If one of them's outside the room, if, one of them, if we go less than zero with x, it doesn't matter what y is, it can be anything. Uh, in fact, y should be within the, the realm of x. Um, so, let's say... Um, one way of doing it would be use this choose thing again. And we say choose um, minus 100 or room width plus... 100. And that's good, that'll pick a, a value that's outside the room for sure, and it'll be random whether it's left or right. And we'll do the same thing for this, but with room height. And the only problem with that is it, it will always be outside of both dimensions, so it will always be in the corners, um, which is a little bit weird, it's not what we want. So let's fix that and say, um, uh, we'll do, I haven't really done stuff like this before, but I want to do an if statement where there's a 50% chance it will do it will be true and a 50% chance it will be false. So let's just do true, choose, true or false. So 50% of the time this will evaluate to true, and the other 50% it will evaluate to false. And what we want is to sometimes be uh, within the room in, the, in only the x direction, and sometimes be within the room in only the y direction, but never both. Uh, so. That would be, uh, let's make this the x1, and now we'll replace that with random room width. So if this thing about x is true, then x would be within our room width, would be within the room, but y will definitely be outside the room. It'll either be off the top by 100 or off the bottom by 100. So that's coming in at a random point from the top wall or the bottom wall. And then if we do a similar thing with y in this eventuality, then x will definitely be outside our room. It will either be on the far left or far right. Sorry, I don't want it to be outside the room. I want it to be a little bit inside the room. Um, in fact, we could just make it exactly at the room with this. I was thinking I want them to spawn outside, but I don't want them to spawn outside because the bounce code will make them walk away if they do. <laughs> uh, so let's just do zero. Um, and that should be it. Yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> so this chooses between the extremities of the room, and this chooses uh, within the room. So hopefully that will, obviously I need to actually tell it to use spawn x and spawn y. Um, and then, so we have a bounce off walls code, and if it tries to go outside the room, it should push it back in. We'll see if that happens. If it doesn't, we can force it to go towards the player. But hopefully they should at least not spawn on you when you're just walking around the room. If they go to the edges, there's a chance they might, but you won't spend a lot of time there. And the players are kind of used to that. If you go near the edge of the room, you know you might get screwed. <laughs> um, so pick up the weapon. Get everybody. It looks like it's happening, doesn't it? Yep, there's one. And there's more. I'm not seeing a spawn anywhere except the edges. Awesome. Okay, so I think that's working. Um, yeah, and as I say, next time we'll get to like picking up different weapons and we'll start changing the properties of the weapons. But obviously, you only have to do timers now, so you could use that to vary rate of fire. Um, and you could probably just duplicate that weapon object actually and just um, uh, make a second one that has a different name and has different properties, and then when you pick it up, it will replace it. Um, but next time we'll get into like a proper array where we'll be able to pick up multiple weapons at once and switch between them and that kind of stuff.